Epoxy Granite makes an amazing machine base, but there is a bit of work that goes into it. This is a full tutorial on how to achieve fantastic results. I've broken it down into four parts. First, we'll go over the theory, some experimentation, the build, and finally some results. Building a solid base for machinery can be a daunting task. The base needs to be strong, stiff, absorb vibrations, and be mechanically accurate. This is a lot to ask. A metal frame would satisfy strength, stiffness, and mechanical accuracy, but would perform very poorly in absorbing vibrations. This is quantified by a material specification called the loss coefficient. Loss coefficient is the internal friction of a material. Ever wonder why symbols are made of a copper alloy? They have incredibly low internal friction, so they will ring for a very long time. On the screen is a loss coefficient chart with a few common machine frame materials called out. It's plotted against Young's modulus, which is a measure of stiffness. The higher the loss coefficient, the less it will vibrate under impact. See our copper symbols way down there at the bottom? Three popular metals are highlighted. Aluminum, steels, and cast iron. All have very poor loss coefficients, but are very stiff. The high loss materials, elastomers, foams, and polymers all have low stiffness. This means you can't have both a high internal loss material and a stiff material, right? Enter composites. Combine two materials, one with high stiffness and one with high internal friction. This is where epoxy granite takes over as a superb machine-based material. For my designs, I use an aluminum frame to provide the stiff skeleton and the epoxy granite to provide the shape and vibration damping properties. Best of both worlds, high stiffness and incredible vibration damping. The composite frame is shown on the screen. The reference surfaces are all made of aluminum and machined to exact dimensions. However, the epoxy granite fills in all of the rest of the space, providing the vibration damping and also looking pretty good. The aluminum reference surfaces are all joined by an internal aluminum skeleton frame. The epoxy granite is then poured around the aluminum skeleton to form the complete machine base. Next up is to find the best ratio to create the epoxy granite mixture. The goal here is to minimize the amount of epoxy needed since it's quite expensive. For my experimentation, I played around with the proportions of four different ingredients looking for the best ratio. The first ingredient is play sand. Nice and simple, can be purchased from Home Depot, a gravel supplier, Walmart, pretty much anywhere. Second ingredient is rocks. These can be purchased from most landscaping yards. Any variety is fine, round or smooth. You want to make sure the largest rocks in the gravel are less than one third the width of the thinnest section of your casting, otherwise you may have flow issues. The third ingredient is dye. This is used to turn the mixture to any color of your choice in order to improve the aesthetics. For black, iron oxide can be used. Alternatively, any epoxy dye or any paint pigment could also be used. The fourth and final ingredient is a two-part epoxy. This is the binder that holds everything together. Any brand will work. The key here is to find a slow cure time epoxy. Thick molds can take up to 48 hours to cure. The slow cure time helps trapped air rise to the surface, letting you achieve that smooth walled finish. Additionally, a slow cure epoxy will generate less heat, which will warp your mold less, which will keep all your tolerances high. I've included some links to these materials in the description below. A few basic tools help make things easier. Here's what you'll need. First is a mixing bucket. Epoxy granite can make a bit of a mess and will most likely ruin whatever you're going to put it in. The high top five gallon buckets really help contain the mess and splashing during mixing. You could do the mixing by hand, but in large quantities, it just won't do a satisfactory job. The key to a good machine base is a solid mix job. Using a drill and a mixing paddle takes the guesswork out of it and ensures a thorough mix. I'd also highly recommend some gloves. It makes cleanup a lot easier. A shaker table is a nice to have, but not necessary. What it will do is help remove more of the trapped air from the molds, especially if they're more than an inch or two deep. You can get by without one, but if you want the best result, I'd recommend one. There are two options. The first is to buy it. The second is the DIY. A do-it-yourself version can be quite a bit cheaper and you can customize the table size to meet the project. There are three simple parts you need to buy, totaling around $100. Rubber feet, a plywood deck, and a shaker motor. Simply bolt the feet and the shaker motor to the plywood deck. 
The motor will generate the needed vibrations and the feet will help isolate the vibrations to just the platform. The deck thickness may need to be reinforced depending on the weight of the machine base. Start with half inch thick plywood and you can always double up if needed. Links for everything are in the description below. Okay, let's get into the experimentation. I'll go through all my failed attempts and discuss what worked and what didn't. In total, I ended up experimenting with seven different samples, changing the blend ratios of the ingredients before I finally settled on a solid contender. The first prototype was 59% sand, 29% rock, and 12% epoxy. It was a decent result, although there was a bit too much embedded air that resulted in a lot of cavities. The second prototype was 58% sand, 29% rock, 13% epoxy, and a few drops of blue dye. The blue dye worked really well to color the epoxy granite, but there are still too many embedded air pockets. The third prototype was 57% sand, 29% rock, 14% epoxy, and a little bit of black dye. This time, a vacuum pump was used to try and pull air out of the epoxy test piece. However, what this ended up doing was fluffing up the mixture into Swiss cheese, since the vacuum pump was unable to fully pull the air out of the mixture. However, this did reduce the density by about 25%. With more experimentation, and perhaps a pressure chamber, this probably could have had a more successful result. But, the final machine base was too large to vacuum pump, so this idea was abandoned. The fourth prototype was 62% sand, 24% rock, 14% epoxy, and a little bit of black dye. The sand was put through a sieve to separate out the smartest particles to form around 17% fine sand and 45% regular sand. This resulted in a much smoother test piece, but there was still some voids on the surface. The fifth prototype was 69% sand, 17% iron oxide as dye, and 14% epoxy. This sample came out great. In the picture, the white on the ends is the wax from the mold release. However, I couldn't find large quantities of iron oxide for cheap, so the prototyping continued. Rocks were eliminated from this sample since they were causing a lot of voids, and the aluminum skeleton would provide the stiffness needed. The sixth prototype was 85% sand, 15% epoxy, and a little bit of black dye. Now, down to just three simple ingredients. Starting to get really close here, but still needs a bit more epoxy to fill in the voids. The seventh and final prototype was 80% sand, 20% epoxy, and a little bit of black dye. This was a beautiful result with a perfect surface finish. A solution was finally found. It was vibrated for the first 30 minutes during cure as well. It turns out keeping things simple works the best. On to stage three, the build. The first step is to lay out all the pieces of the mold and the skeleton and wash them with soapy water to clean. Assemble the mold by fastening all of the pieces together. One thing that should be mentioned is epoxy will stick to almost everything. However, it will not stick to wax. For this reason, a wax mold release was used on the mold. Apply the mold release to the entire surface, making sure to let it dry. Wipe off the excess mold release and then repeat the application. It is key to not miss any spots. I also used waxed fillet sticks and carefully molded them into sharp corners to create the internal radii that will produce the smooth transitions between all of the surfaces. Sharp 90 degree internal corners are a recipe for disaster. Filling them in afterwards will be hard and they will be prone to chipping. Next, insert the assembled skeleton into the mold. Use tape to cover any screw holes that may be needed later. Make sure the skeleton frame doesn't get any wax on it. Now the mold is built and waxed with the internal skeleton frame in place. Double check that all mold surfaces are waxed and any threaded holes that will be needed later are covered with tape. Prepare the ingredients and the mixing tool. Here's the order I went about mixing. First, pour an 80% sand by weight into a bucket. You can use a bathroom scale to do this. Next, pour in part A of the epoxy and thoroughly mix for two to three minutes. The epoxy won't cure until part B is added, so there's no need to panic yet. Next, pour in the dye. I used around a quarter percent by weight, but your portion will depend on the strength of the dye. Finally, 
pour in part B of the epoxy and mix thoroughly for five to 10 minutes. You need to make sure it's thoroughly mixed. Very slowly pour the mixture into the mold. You really want to minimize the amount of air that is introduced at this point. Place the mold on the shaker table to help agitate the air to the surface. Vibrate the entire mixture for the full working time of the epoxy that was purchased. In my case, that was 40 minutes of vibration. It took about 5 minutes, but then air bubbles started slowly rising to the surface and continued to do so the whole time the table was vibrating. When the working time is up, turn off the vibration table and use fast passes with a heat gun on the surface of the epoxy to pop any remaining air bubbles. Here is the result of putting in all of this hard work. You're left with an incredibly clean and smooth molded epoxy base. This machine base will be incredibly solid, dampen all the vibrations, and will impress anyone that works with the equipment sitting on top of it.